with the kids' schedules or interior design choices at home or interpersonal relationships. I'm, I'm going to do pretty well in those matchups. I'm going to be honest with you. But there's a category, probably many categories, but at least one category of topics where that is just not the case for me. When we talk about rockets or space, or robotics, or engineering, or, or math, or, or science, or anything at all that requires spatial reasoning, honestly. Even I, who enjoy a little debate for fun, I am not going to even start a fight with him about any of that. It's completely off limits to me. Why? Because I am guaranteed a 0% chance of success. I know before I even begin that I'm going to lose that fight. Pigs are going to fly and we're going to have pregnant pole vaulters before I am going to win an argument with Kenton Kirkpatrick about aerospace anything. It is not worth me putting an ounce of energy into that. No matter what research I do or how I prepare, the tactic I take, I am not going to win. So to invest time and energy and capital there would really be foolish. Can you think of an area like that with somebody in your life where you're just not even going to go there because there is just no point? <laughs> Maybe you've had an argument so many times and nothing changes or, or you just know that they know more about it and it's not worth it. You know, on our better days, we don't tend to just launch headlong into an argument. Hopefully most of the time we're going to consider ahead of time before we even begin. And the question we should consider is this, is this fight worth it? Psalm 48 tackles that kind of mindset, but from a spiritual perspective. How do you know when the fight is worth fighting? But this time, the person that folks are fighting against is God. And instead of setting up the example as just a war of words, the psalm remembers back to a time when there was a literal battle, a physical fight between God and other armies. And the question for those other armies is, is this fight a fight worth starting? So let's go and take a look at that passage this morning. I think we're going to find it really interesting. Again, it's in Psalms, which, as Miss Paula said, is close to the middle of your Bible, a little to the left of the middle. And we're going to be reading from Psalm 48 today. Does your Bible have a note right after the title, Psalm 48, a Psalm of the Korahites? Okay, just keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that. In the city belonging to our God, the Lord is great and so worthy of praise. His holy mountain is a beautiful summit, the joy of the whole world. Mount Zion in the far north is the city of the great king. God is in its fortifications revealing himself as a place of safety. Not that Jerusalem is a place of safety, but he is a... Okay. Look. The kings assembled themselves, advancing all together, and when they saw it, they were stunned. They panicked and ran away, frightened, trembling, took hold of them right there like a woman giving birth, or like the east wind when it smashes the ships of Tarshish. Just like we had heard, now we have seen it for ourselves. In the city of the Lord of heavenly forces, and the city of our God, may God make it secure forever." We dwell on your faithful love, God, in your temple. Your praise, God, just like your reputation, extends to the far corners of the earth. Your strong hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice because of your acts of justice. Walk around Zion. Go all the way around it. Count its towers. Examine its defenses closely. Tour its fortifications so that you may tell future generations this. This is God, our God, forever and always. He is the one who will lead us even to the very end. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Okay, remember that Jerusalem had the temple. And in the temple is God's house called the Holy of Holies, where the literal presence of God was located on all the earth, according to the way that God presented it in the Old Testament. So this psalm praises Jerusalem, the city belonging to our God, his holy mountain, a beautiful summit, the joy of the whole world, count its towers, tour its fortifications, but it's not because Jerusalem is more beautiful than other places or more powerful than other places or more wealthy than other places. Verse 3 tells us it is because who is there? God is there. So the Korahites, they're the authors of this song. Side note, every psalm was originally a hymn. And the Korahites were the name of the temple's choir. Okay, So they are singing about this time recently when the kings of the world lined up against Jerusalem. Now, to be sure, at the time, Jerusalem was a little closer to Mobile, Alabama than New York City, okay, in terms of the ancient world stage. And there is no reason that a group of kings and their armies should have any trouble fighting and winning against the army of Jerusalem. These collective armies have beaten other people under much more challenging tactical circumstances. In their minds, as they prep for battle, this is a fight worth having. Just looking at the geography and the resources, they have a great chance at success. But they forgot one thing. What'd they forget? Exactly. Jesus, <laughs> Je not Jesus, Jerusalem is not just a city. Jerusalem is God's home. God is there within it. And so they lined up for battle, and it says, so look, the kings assembled themselves, advancing all together. When they saw it, they were stunned. They panicked. They ran away frightened. Because here's the thing. When it was just the people of Jerusalem they were fighting, it was a fight worth having. But all of a sudden, they realize that they are not just fighting the people of Jerusalem. They are fighting God. And that is not a fight worth fighting when you are stacking yourself up against God. So we read this psalm today, and we think at first, well, you know, that's nice. Uh, don't attack Jerusalem because God's there. Great advice for modern-day Iran or Iraq. It doesn't have a whole lot to do with you and me, you might think. But you know, this psalm has a deeper meaning than that. Because when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn in two. There was a curtain that separated the Holy of Holies, the presence of God on earth, from the rest of the world. And the moment that Jesus died, all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, but you and I know where it came from, that curtain was torn, fell to the floor, and in that moment, God's presence was no longer contained to just the Holy of Holies. God's presence was unleashed in the world. And on the day of Pentecost, the early Christians came to understand that now God's presence is where? Within us. Within those who place their lives in God's hands. And so, as Hastings said, past all barriers, visible and invisible, here and now, we may seek and find and touch the living God. That is the truth that after we discover it, we begin really to live. No church or priest, no system of thinking or system of worship, no privilege of learning or privilege of place, and the last resort can stand between a man and his God. Here and now, we may touch the living God, he said, because he is within our very soul. So friends, since we live in the post-Pentecost age, where is God's home? Inside us. So when battles come our way, when enemies line up against us, when a health issue threatens to undo us, it could appear at first glance that they have a good shot. Because to them, they believe that they are just fighting us, but they're not, are they? Because we are now the city belonging to our God. We are his holy 
mountain. We are the joy of the whole world. We are the fortification for the home of God. You are not just you. I am not just me. We are the home of God Almighty, and God defends and protects his home. So there is no fight that you take on by yourself. God is always in it with you. Amen? They're not just going up against you. They're going up against God in you. When something comes up against you, you are not in it alone. It does not only depend on your strength or your smarts or your energy or your abilities. They come up against God Almighty within you. And you may say, yeah, Lindsay, that's nice, but bad things still happen. Some illnesses still lead to death. People get treated badly at work. Bad things happen in families. Yes, that is true. And some of those things are so awful that we have to end up saying, nope, what you went through was just, in some cases, pure evil. God wasn't in that other than suffering alongside you through it. And in circumstances like that, here's what I know. The enemies can win a battle, but they never win the war. Amen. Our God always has the ultimate victory even if the thing hurts us even if it kills us god wins we win because god has arranged it so that we have life after life after life after life no matter the day no matter the circumstance whatever the day brings we can say along with verse 14 all right this is god our god forever and always And that God has his home within us. And therefore, when troubles come our way, when we feel like we are being hit on every side, we are not the only ones getting hit. God is in us, and we are not the only ones fighting. God is in you. And Hastings said again, and this really beautiful thing in his way of speaking over 100 years ago, It is of supremest importance for us to know what kind of infinitude we are in interior communion with. Isn't that beautiful? You have infinity in your hearts. First, in terms of your physical body, the molecules of your body originally coming from exploding stars. I mean, just think about how nothing really ends, the beauty of how God makes all things new. But even more than that, God Almighty, the one who was and is and is to come, is within you. What kind of infinity is it with which you have constant interior communion? A couple weeks ago, we read what is actually the first description of who God is in the entire Bible It's in the passage of scripture that is, and this passage of scripture is the most quoted one within the Bible itself. And what does it say? The God within you is merciful and full of grace. The God within you is slow to anger. The God within you is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The clearest, most concise description of the God within you is, who you have constant interior communion with. And what that means is that once you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and you place all of your trust in his grace and you seek him daily and you serve him daily and you enjoy God daily, you are now a home of God. And it's this very same God that our enemies sometimes decide to start a fight with when God is within us. God protects and defends his home. The God who is full of grace and mercy, abounding in steadfast love, slow to anger, and always faithful, this is the kind of eternity that lives in your heart. This is the God within you. And on our best days, we live in sync with the God within us. But if we're honest, there are some days we find ourselves fighting against God too. There are times, friends, when God is trying to say something to us and we silence God's voice. Sometimes we give God excuses like that'll work. Sometimes it's just a matter of charging ahead on something without being quiet long enough to hear God's leading first. At any rate, in these moments, yes, God is still within us. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave us. But it is as though 
We push the mute button on the spirit, and we put our si- ourselves on the opposing team. We switch sides, if only for a moment. We've all done this, either intentionally or unintentionally, fought against God instead of with God. There's a name for it. It's called sin. <laughs> We've probably all done it this week. So how can we know then, what is the clue? What is the trigger to let us know when we ourselves are accidentally fighting against God? Two things, a quick test. One, does the monologue in my head, the rationale I'm using for why I'm doing what I'm doing, does it sound like Jesus? Does it sound like Jesus? And secondly, Has God put any checks in my spirit, any warning flags that this way of thinking or acting or speaking might be against his will? It can be as simple as functioning out of pride or greed for a moment or ignoring someone God wants us to show love and grace to or pretending something is of God when it's really just something we want ourselves. Sometimes it's making room for one thing in our life to the exclusion of time with God in our life. And once we realize that we are fighting against God, And God's will, hopefully, we decide real quick that that is not a fight worth fighting, (laughs) that we are guaranteed to lose. And we humbly walk through the battlefields, no man's land, ask for God's forgiveness, and join his team again. Because here's the truth. God is not on our side. It might be tempting looking at this passage saying, look, God is on the side of the people of Jerusalem, but no, he's not. God is on God's side. We see the truth displayed pretty quickly and clearly in the battle of Jericho. You remember that one? Joshua is moving in on Jericho before anything has even happened, and a man appears in front of him, and Joshua asks the question, Well, first, it's not very clear at first. Is this God? Is it one of God's angels? We don't know for sure. Joshua says, are you on our side or are you on our enemy's side? And the angel says, no. (laughs) No. He goes on to say he is the commander of God's army. In other words, he is on whose side? God's side. So in our psalm this morning, God is not on the side of the people of Jerusalem. God is on God's side, and the people of Jerusalem choose to live there in his home. Do you see the difference there? The same is true for us. God is not on the side of our sports team. I'm sorry. I know. I love the Astros too. God is not on the side of any party or country. God is not on my side or on your side in a difficult situation. God is on God's side. And a team or a country or a person, we can choose to join God and be on God's side. And when we do that, then we guarantee that there is no battle that we fight alone. God needs to be the one leading, not us. You know, this past week I got to talk with a friend that I recently reconnected with. She and her husband were very good friends of ours and have a lovely family, and they were the couple that Kenton and I wanted to be like uh, a couple years into our own marriage. They were so kind to us. Almost a year ago, he announced that he was moving out, and she told me that at first, she was so panicked, she felt so betrayed, that she spent the first few weeks being hurt and offended and trying to figure out how she was going to fix it, who she could get to talk to him and talk some sense into him, what she could say to him that would make him want to come back. She told me, I definitely entered this storm ready for it to be a test of my strength and my endurance, of my love for my husband, of my ability to find a fix for any problem, and my desire to honor my covenant. What I was not looking for, she said, was peace, And what I was not willing to do was surrender. The idea of that felt like failure to me, she said. Laziness or lack of love or will or desire to restore my marriage. What I got was a lot of disappointment, pain, anger, fear, rejection. No perfection and certainly no peace. 
She said, I didn't want to quit and believe, and I believe in my husband and my marriage and God's heart for restoration. So I could not figure out why nothing was working. And she said, then as I cried out to him to answer me, to do something, to fix it, to soothe her broken heart and battered spirit, she said, I got a word from God, which was the first time this had happened in her life. She said she was driving to one of her daughter's volleyball games alone in the car with her husband just minutes behind her in his own vehicle. And she said, I could not take it anymore. The noise, the Christian radio blaring praise and worship, the words of hate that he had said to me the last time we saw each other, the well-meaning advice from friends and loved ones, my own inner voice screaming how unworthy and how unlovable I was. She said, I turned off the radio and started praying, crying and screaming at the top of my lungs. This is so unfair. I don't deserve this. I am human and imperfect, but I love him and I have for almost 25 years. Nothing is working. I'm so tired and hopeless, but I don't want to quit. Is there another way, God? Please help me because I am doing everything in my power and in that instant she said God cut me off and clear as day said your power where do you think your power comes from where does your help come from stop asking me to send him home to you and start praying for him to come home to me God said, this is not just about marriage restoration. This is about heart transformation. How about you focus on connecting with me and let me focus on him? And then she said, these bullet statements rang loud and clear in her mind. And they were these. Wait. I will restore. There is peace in the storm. The battle is not about you. The real enemy is not him. They're still in that. Nothing's fixed. But she told me that when she was fighting and trying under her own power, she felt constantly afraid and exhausted and defeated. She said, when I got out of the way and surrendered him and our marriage to God, I finally felt peace. He's the one standing for marriage. He's simply asking me to stand with him. You hear the difference there? Have faith and receive the peace that passes all understanding while he shelters me in the storm. God is in your fortifications, revealing himself as the place of safety. Look, the kings can assemble themselves and they can advance. But when the enemy sees God in you, they are stunned and panicked and run away frightened. This is God, our God, forever and always. He is the one who will lead us even to the very end. So there is no fight you show up to alone. You are a house of God. And God defends his home. So don't try to control or strategize or run the battles in your life. Hand that over to God. Join his side and let him be the one to lead you to victory. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning we have the opportunity to to take Holy Communion together. If you want an individual portion, then the ushers have those if you don't already have one. Or you can come forward and take communion in a moment. You'll be given a piece of bread and a little cup, and you can take them together up here. If you already have yours, just wait one moment um, so that we can take those together. I want you to take a moment and uh, remember what it means that Jesus gave his body for us. Let's join together. May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. And it's a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ that we might be for the whole world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ. One with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at this heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to ask those who are helping to serve communion to come forward at this time. Whenever we take communion, we also take it as an opportunity to give to missions as well. Any financial gifts that are left on the communion rail today will be given to the McFarland Scholarship Fund, which is the scholarship that Asbury gives out to, um, to graduating seniors who are continuing their education. So any gifts that are placed there will be given there. And I do encourage you to take a moment and to kneel and to pray as you receive communion today. And then you'll exit through the, the center aisle here.
in the month of July, we have encouraged you at the 9 o'clock service to choose some of your favorite hymns for us to sing. And the closing hymn today is one of those. It's Amazing Grace. We hope that if you're at home, you'll sing with us. If you're in the sanctuary, please stand as you are able as we sing 378, Amazing Grace. <laughs> Well, thank you for worshiping with us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again next Sunday. If you will, take a moment before uh, you leave today and share this worship service online so that other family and friends will be able to worship along with us today too. I hope the women of the church will take a moment next Saturday to join us for the brunch put on by the UMW. We have a fun morning of fellowship. And also, as we walk out these doors today, y'all don't forget the popsicles and the watermelon that are in the main hall waiting for you there just to celebrate a little bit today. But as we go from this place, remember God goes before you to show you the way, behind you to keep you moving, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, and within you always to give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.